everyone thank you for your time on this lovely day so i bet you're all thinking a solo podcast don't have to listen to stelios for a whole hour no that's not the case it's just a quick update we thought that you all deserved it because i've had lots of texts emails facebook messages everyone asking oh what's the deal what's the deal what's happening so we wanted to give you all a bit of an update so i am going to just go through some listener questions and you know they've put them up on facebook they've sent me text messages and um, we'll get on with that now. Um, so why did the podcast come about, first one? So that's come about because with some of the YouTube videos that we did, people wanted to ask more questions. So that, you know, we wanted to sort of look at something where we could have a long-form conversation. And and podcast is perfect for that. The other good thing is that it doesn't have to be as short as a YouTube video because you can just press pause and go on and do whatever else you were doing. Most people have texted me saying they've been, you know, listening whilst driving or whilst cutting the fish in the morning or doing their prep or whatever it may be, you know. So it's a good it's good that you just do it in your own time, chill out and relax and hopefully you enjoy it and get something from it. Um so what type of people are we thinking of interviewing? Hopefully more of the same. So ideally we want people from within the food industry, um fish and chip industry, hospitality, um, anyone that supplies any of this. Um, you know, we spoke to Andrew from the NFFF. We're going to talk to someone from the Potato Board, someone from Seafish, MSC. If they're willing to give up their time, we'll travel to see them and get it done. Um, but every now and then, we also want to talk to somebody from the wider hospitality industry to get a feel for what they're doing. You know, I really think that we can learn from their story and today on the same day you'll see that we're releasing the thomas colombo podcast and you know he's a mixologist and you know he's doing something different so i think that we can all learn from that so steady us what's the best fish and chip shop you've been to it doesn't matter your reasons but one that's really impressed you and why hmm <laughs> so that's a really difficult question um really difficult it sounds easy but it's not i truly believe there's no such thing as the best fish and chip shop to someone like me. I visit far too many. It's difficult to put a pin on it. Um, But the word best is is probably used by people that visit what is truly their favourite, their local, the one they love going to the most. And um, so I've got a few I can cover. um, And here's my choices. Um, And this is biased because I like these guys and I like the food they do. So, you know, one of my favourites is the Magpie Cafe in Whitby. I love the food, I love the service, I love the location. It hits the spot. It, it, you know, the, the service is really good. It just, it feels special. Um, you know, so, you know, Coleman's is very good. Um, I've been there a few times. Um, I do need to visit Coleman's Temple soon. Um, but also, Shea Fred in Bournemouth is up there. I mean, like, one of the best, you know. So... They're all restaurants, they're all sit-downs, and I tend to prefer my fish and chips on a plate, and maybe I'm posh, I get that. Um, but as a takeaway, you know, but, you know, one shop that's really surprised me is um, is a small shop in Barnsley called Y Pass. Uh, and um, to many people, they'd drive past it, won't take a second look, um, but you'd be a fool. Um, you know, the, 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 this small fish and chip shop hardly sells pies, doesn't sell kebabs. It's hardly open, really. But when they're open, they're always busy, you know. And and I think that it's really important to not judge a book by its cover because I think that the the word best covers so many different things. And there's great takeaways, great restaurants. So I wouldn't just apply it to one one fish and chip shop. Um, so Danny, you know, there's no such thing to me as best because I just see too many. Um, and I do know that many considered as the best in our industry would be the first to tell you that they're not the best and they're definitely not perfect. So, Danny, that's my answer. Andreas, <laughs> this is a good question, although I don't like answering these types of questions. How will a hard Brexit affect the industry in the short term and long term? Well, I'm not a clairvoyant, so I don't know is the answer. 
Um, but there's a few things that will probably be an issue. Um, but the biggest thing is probably going to be free movement of people, which now disappears. Um, and that obviously affects staffing. And, you know, hospitality isn't the most desirable job in the world to many, hence why it's hard to find staff. So I think that's probably where the government will need to focus their efforts, um, make sure that, you know, whether it's a visa-based system and, you know, it's a bit easier to come into the UK for those sort of jobs. Um, but it is also worth noting that unemployment in the UK is around 4%. That's 1.36 million people, give or take. Um, so that means that there is also lots of let's say people that are allowed to be in the UK that, that live over here that can sort of take those jobs and I do think that hospitality is a good sector for those people you know it's you know but I think we've as an industry the hospitality sector probably has to do more as well um, overall I think it's best not to speculate I think it's best just to wait and see wait and see which option the UK takes and um, the truth is no one actually knows what the outcome is going to be but thanks for that question, Andy. I knew that was probably going to come from you. So, question from Imran. Well, actually, there was five questions from Imran with four sub-questions. But I've chosen one because some of the other questions you asked are probably going to be covered in the next few podcasts. And, you know, so we've got some plans there. So, I'm, I'm dealing with this question. What do you think is the next big thing for fish and chips? Um, well... It's a difficult one because, again, it's such a wide-ranging question, but I'm going to focus on one answer. So my opinion, the next big thing for fish and chips is great fish and chips. And I know that sounds silly, but it's actually pretty true. Customers now are wanting the best for their money. The, you know, whatever it is. And I think the way to do that sometimes is to be niche. You can't do everything. It's physically impossible. And you can't do everything great. So I think we're starting to see a lot of green shoots from great operators that are focusing on fish and chips and seafood. And, um, and I know that's hard if you've already got a business model that doesn't have that. But I think that the simplicity and the smaller menu and, and, and the tag of, you know, artisan or specialist, I think that really can help and i think that that's probably what's helping some shops um totally get if that's not your business plan it doesn't work but i think that that is probably what i would say the next big thing for fish and chips so rather than going broader bring it in and make it more niche so thanks for that question imran and like i said some of the other questions that you asked will be covered in future podcasts so question from nick what is the best oil stroke fat for frying well, it's an interesting question i'm not going to go into brands um because i'm not like that but let's talk about the two different answers so looking at it from a, a really technical point of view i would say it depends what you want from a frying medium if you want longevity stability and a really crisp product i would say you need to be looking for a medium with a high saturated fat content I think saturated fat will form with the fried product and create bonds um, with the carbohydrate. And that gives you a really crispy, firm product, which is nice. And, you know, it's nice. Um, the downside with most saturated fats is that they will solidify on the product. And it can give a bit of an aftertaste and palate cling. Um, that probably goes back to why hot tea is consumed with fish and chips in the olden days. And also, you know, um, a notable recipe is that McDonald's had, back in the day, used to use beef dripping or tallow. And they used to mix that with cottonseed oil. Um, so that would give them that sort of robustness from the saturated fat. Um, but not so much the palate cling because of that had the, the, the cottonseed oil. Um, but... One thing I would say is that if you can't or you don't want to use um, a saturated fat uh, or an oil high in saturated fat, the next option is to use an oil high in monounsaturated fat. Um, there are a few good choices. Um, you talk to your wholesalers, they'll, they'll give you some choices there um, or just message me. Um, but the oils to really avoid um, are oils that are high in polyunsaturates. They, they, you know, they break down really fast um, and they can be inflammatory. And they also have a, a high buildup of aldehydes. So it's definitely worth avoiding anything high in polyunsaturates. Um, secondly, so secondly, and the probably easy way to look at it is what are others using locally? So, for example, if you're in a part of Yorkshire and everyone's using beef dripping, 
you've got two choices. You can use beef dripping because everyone else does, or you can use one of the others above that I mentioned and be different. You've got to take that risk or at least, you know, just think about it carefully. And I think that you, know, you don't have to do what everyone does locally, but if you don't want to look at it from a technical point of view, you can look at it from that point of view as well. And that should help you out and get you along. So two questions from Sarah, but, you know, they're one essentially. So, well, they're all on the same line. So question one, oh, just put it all together. Is there a list of planned interviews and topics for the future? And do you take suggestions? So the, the easy answer is we probably won't publish a list of who we're going to interview, um, but we will try and follow interesting topic, topics or relevant topics of the moment. Um, and do we take suggestions? Why not? You know, we want you to care. We want your feedback. We want everything. And that's from everybody. So, you know, send it back. We're happy to take it on and uh, see what we can do. Um, but yeah, um, as for um, any interesting topics, you just send it our way and we'll see what we can do with that. So do you have any podcast recommendations I can listen to? Yes, I listen to a lot of podcasts. Cause I'm on the road a lot. And I would recommend Free Economics by Stephen Dubner. A really good podcast that makes you think about the hidden aspects of decisions that are made or even the consequences, you know, of something that happened. Really good, worth listening to. And then The Bottom Line by Evan Davis. It's a great business show. It's BBC podcast. It's really good. And then a really good one is season season one and season two of The Revisionist History by Malcolm Gladwell. Um, three great podcasts to get you started. Um, and let me know what you think of them. So last question from Grace. Do you have any book recommendations? Yep, I read a lot of books. I have a lot of books and it's worth recommending. So one book that got recommended to me was from Marcus French. Um, he's got a shop in Wales next to sea, Norfolk. And he, he might have even bought me a copy of this book. And it's Free Economics by Stephen Dubner. And that's how I got to know about the podcast from the book. It's a really good book. It's very easy to read. And it's just really interesting. Again, it's about the, the, the hidden economics behind decisions and the consequences of them. So that, that book's really cheap now. Everyone can get it from anywhere. So get that book. Um, but if you was going to buy one book today and you're in the food industry, I would say it's um, Grinding It Out by Ray Kroc. And he was the founder of McDonald's as we know it today. Um, and I read it a lot and over and over again when I had the fish and chip shops when I worked for, when I worked for my dad. And um, yeah, I just I just there's no reason why not to buy that book. I think it's like six quid new. Um, it should be, you know, a good book to start on if you're in the food industry. So those are my book choices. Um, so on that note, everyone, I'd like to put this to bed. Have a great Christmas and a great new year. Um, I look forward to all your feedback. And uh, that's it. Don't eat too much chocolate. Catch you later.